The quantities of the fractions initially produced in an oil refinery don't match up with what is needed by consumers. There is not much demand for the longer chain high molecular weight hydrocarbons, but a large demand for those of lower molecular weight, for example petrol. A process called cracking is used to produce more of the lower molecular weight hydrocarbons. This process breaks up the longer chains into smaller ones. There are many different industrial versions of cracking, but all rely on heating. When heated, the particles move much more quickly and their rapid movement causes carbon-carbon bonds to break. The major forms of cracking are thermal cracking, catalytic or cat cracking, steam cracking, and hydrocracking. Because they differ in reaction conditions, the products of each type of cracking will vary. Most produce a mixture of saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons. Thermal cracking is the simplest and oldest process. The mixture is heated to around 750 to 900 degrees Celsius at a pressure of 700 kilopascals. That is around seven times atmospheric pressure. This process produces alkenes such as ethene and propene and leaves a heavy residue. The most effective process in creating lighter alkanes is called catalytic cracking. The long carbon bonds are broken by being heated to around 500 degrees Celsius in an oxygen-free environment in the presence of zeolite. This crystalline substance, made of aluminium, silicon and oxygen, acts as a catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction or allows it to proceed at a lower temperature than would normally be required. During the process, the catalyst, usually in the form of a powder, is treated and reused over and over again. Catalytic cracking is the major source of hydrocarbons with 5 to 10 carbon atoms in the chain. The molecules most formed are the smaller alkanes used in petrol, such as propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane and octane, the components of liquid petroleum gas. In hydrocracking, crude oil is heated at very high pressure, usually around 5,000 kilopascals, in the presence of hydrogen with a metallic catalyst such as platinum, nickel or palladium. This process tends to produce saturated hydrocarbons such as shorter carbon chain alkanes because it adds a hydrogen atom to alkenes and aromatic hydrocarbons. It is a major source of kerosene jet fuel gasoline components and LPG. In one method, thermal steam cracking, the hydrocarbon is diluted with steam and then briefly heated in a very hot furnace around 850 degrees Celsius without oxygen. The reaction is only allowed to take place very briefly. Light hydrocarbons break down to the lighter alkenes, including ethene, propene and butene, which are useful for plastics manufacturing. Heavier hydrocarbons break down to some of these, but also give products rich in aromatic hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons suitable for inclusion in petrol or diesel. So today we're going to do C.2.2. We're going to compare catalytic cracking with thermal cracking and steam cracking. And cracking is basically, you know, just like it sounds, you're breaking something down. And in this case, we're breaking down basically the long chain hydrocarbons that come from crude oil. And we're going to break them down into smaller molecules, which are more useful for some of our engines and some of our um, industrial processes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different types of cracking. And we're going to start off with catalytic cracking, uh, because that was the one that basically makes most of um, our sort of consumer and alkanes now. So here we do, what we have is we start with a fairly long chain hydrocarbon. So here you can see it's 16 long. 
and through the process of catalytic cracking we use a catalyst to break it down into an alkane and an alkene. And this is important, all of these cracking processes produce an alkene and an alkane. So when we produce our formulas, um, it doesn't have to be C8 um, in particular as long as we're not losing um, any hydrogens or any carbons. So it could be something that was C5 and then something else that was C11. Um, as long as it all adds up, it's fine. And the, um, that's the same thing in thermal cracking. Um, they're gonna, they sort of work with similar chains. It's just um, one uses a catalyst, the other doesn't. And in steam cracking, we're actually starting with smaller, um, sort of medium-sized particles, and we're breaking them down into um, really, really small ones. And so steam cracking is more effective for that. So as we can see here, we're taking in both catalytic and thermal long chains, but in steam cracking, we're taking what the IB calls moderate cha uh, chains, um, so a bit, bit uh, smaller than the long chains. And then they produce, um, in this case, moderate chains, and uh, that's what we use for fuels in catalytic cracking. And again, thermal cracking does the same thing, but steam cracking will give us these small chains. And again, if you look at the formulas here, you'll see that this one is an alkene and that one's an alkane. Now the difference really comes down here, um, or is very well illustrated in the temperature and pressure. So the first is the temperature. Uh, a catalyst, of course, allows a reaction to happen in an alternate pathway, um, which is always a lower energy pathway. So in this case, we need a lower temperature and a lower pressure, and that's going to save a lot of money in terms of inputs to make this process happen. Um, but for thermal cracking, we'll produce the same thing, but we're going to have to use moderate temperatures and high pressure, so it's going to be more expensive. We're going to have to put more energy into this process to get pretty well the same thing as catalytic cracking. Cracking. So that's why catalytic cracking is sort of so popular now. Uh, but when we do want those really small chains um, for petrochemicals, uh, like for plastics and things like this, um, we do need high temperatures and moderate pressures. So that one requires a lot of input. Now none of the other two use a catalyst, but uh, in terms of which one you're going to use, um, the, the one that's really talked about is uh, zeolite. But in terms of the answer keys, um, silica is what you can put down as your answer that they'll accept. In terms of the mechanism, we have uh, two basic um, ways this happens. With a catalyst, uh, we get what we call heterolytic fission, and that's going to give us an ionic carbocation intermediate. I'm going to illustrate what that means in a second. Uh, but thermal and steam will give you homolytic and a free radical um, sort of mechanism. Um, and I'll illustrate that now on the second page. Now it's important to note here that you don't have to draw this. They've never asked you to draw anything like this, but in order to understand what is the difference between heterolytic and homolytic, I would just want to basically illustrate a little bit about what's going on. So in catalytic, we have the heterolytic fission. So what happens here is basically um, the two electrons in this bond between the carbon and hydrogen go to the hydrogen. And I represent that with an arrow with two ends. And what that will mean is since carbon lost the electron it was contributing to this bond, um, when the carbon has one less electron, it is thus then positive. And so this hydrogen actually leaves because it now has two electrons on its own. And this is all facilitated by the catalyst. And uh, so then you're left with this hydrogen basically gone. And I could just try and drag it away, hopefully. That's the one I want. And it's not happy. Let's try again. All right, yeah, so uh, basically it goes away and then you have this left over. Now, you don't really see how this actually ends up making a actual alkane and alkene, and that's because there's actual, you know, extra steps after that. But basically, I want to show you that the heterolytic means that both electrons are going to the hydrogen, leaving you with an ionic carbocation intermediate. And to contrast that with the steam, that works differently. So if we're going to focus, uh, in this case, on this carbon-carbon bond, it doesn't have to be that one. I'm just choosing any one at random. So with um, homolytic, what happens is half of 
the electrodes in the bond go to one carbon and then the half go to the other one. So I represent this by half arrows, not full arrows. So full arrows is heterolytic. The half arrow here shows it's one electron goes here, one electron goes here. So what we end up then um, are basically, and I'll just try and illustrate this here, I'll have this carbon here and this carbon here and then I'm just going to represent the rest of this is just R and the rest of all of this is just R and so since there's no longer a bond here what we have is just each one of them has that one electron each from this bond and when they're like this and they can still make one more bond but they haven't bonded yet um, we call each of these radicals so both of these are radicals and that means they're very reactive so in this case there's no carbocation made there's they're both still neutral um, but we have formed radicals so the mechanism will be radicals react with each other um, to produce our alkanes and alkenes so just to basically summarize homolytic will be one electron denoted by half arrows goes to each carbon but when you're doing catalytic um, converters or cracking in this case you're going to be using um, heterolytic which is shown with a full arrow and that's between the carbon hydrogen leaving you with a carbocation intermediate.